let's open up to 3 John this morning. All right, and Father, thank you. Again, uh, just, Lord, we've longed for the beautiful weather. Thank you for yesterday and what we'll have today before things plunge again later this week. But, Lord, thank you for, uh, again, the seasons of life, Lord. And, and, and in this fellowship, we have felt our seasons for sure, Lord. Um, thank you for uh, just a blessed memorial service for our sister Kathy. And, Lord, uh, just committing her to you in our own hearts. Thank you for just the great things you're doing in, in, in the ministries, Lord, that we have here. It is, it is humbling. Um, thank you. And also, Lord, um, we just ask that as we read your word this morning, Lord, that you would draw us close to you. Lord, that we wouldn't <coughs> hear just the words of an ancient book, but we'd hear the words of our Father. Take them to heart, Lord. Act on them. Trust you in them, Lord. And, and uh, Lord, continue to grow and mature, Lord, into all that you desire us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, another thing, um, just, just I hope you're encouraged by it, but this morning, uh, checking the mail, we received a $10,000 check for the radio. <coughs> um, and, <coughs> yeah, and, and it just, you know, if you've been, uh, not everybody knows, but man, it has just been a battle for the past month, ups and downs, but God just keeps coming through and coming through, and it's just like, now bad news, like, yeah, no big deal, you know, uh, and uh as Jeff said, we signed a lease with KMOT to put uh, our antenna up on their tower. We have floor space in their building. Uh, as of May 1st, we'll be tenants there. And then we begin moving all the equipment and assembling the antenna and installing that uh, the first week of June. And we are in business. Um, the big radio station is, is up and going. Uh, and um, I'm humbled by it. I can't say it's because of my great engineering skills and my radio experience because I virtually had none. And even now, I'm not much of a radio guy. I just know all the right people. And, and this is how God seems to work here. So uh, praise God. Amen. But then our, our vision even beyond that is to begin plant churches or cover pulpits of existing churches out in the prairies. Not to turn them into our denomination per se, but just, and, and, and some of you saw that post We've got an open invitation in Maddock if we want to go to Maddock and plant. There's, there's a family there who would be like, yeah, we'll, we would do this. So maybe Jake will move to Maddock there. And uh, yeah, you know, no pressure <laughs> and start the work, buddy. You know. <laughs> but I have a dream that everybody here will be sent out. Everybody. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? Well, maybe this wouldn't exist, but there'd be like bunches of great works going on. I don't know. It's a, it's a dream. You know, thankful I'm not living the dream right now at this moment. All right, well, 3 John then, <clears throat> as we continue to work our way through the, the New Testament, there's a story about three men who died and went to heaven. And on their arrival, St. Peter met them at the pearly gates. You've probably heard this before. <clears throat> Meeting him at the gates, he said, I'm going to let you in, but I'm going to sternly warn you, whatever you do, don't step on a duck. Having received Peter's warning, the gates were opened, and these three men looked in only to see that there were ducks everywhere. And one man stepped in, and immediately he stepped on a duck. <clears throat> and Peter ran over, and he handcuffed him forever to the most unlikable woman in all of human history. And Peter immediately disappeared. This, of course, as you can imagine, made the other two men acutely aware of the danger of stepping on ducks. And it was several months when one of the two accidentally stepped on a duck. And immediately Peter ran over and handcuffed him eternally to the most homeliest woman ever known. <laughs> this, this might not be a true story, I'm just saying. <laughs> <clears throat> well, several years later, Peter visited the third man and immediately handcuffed him forever to the most gorgeous woman he had ever seen. And the man exclaimed, what did I do to deserve this? And the woman says, I don't know, but I stepped on a duck. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
You know? Well, that might not be a true story, I would admit. <clears throat> but here in John, third John, we're going to read of three men. Two who were commended and one who was criticized. Uh, again, as second John was, it was written, this particular letter was written about 80, 95-ish, there in the middle of the last decade of the first century, just about three years before John actually died. Possibly written from Ephesus, we're not exactly sure, but it seems that it was written to those churches that existed in and around the region of Asia Minor. And he begins at verse 1, the elder, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. So John calls himself here the elder, just as he did in the previous letter. And he says, to the beloved Gaius. Now, we're not sure if 2 John was written to a specific individual. I tend to lean that it was written to a corporate body of believers, but, you know, it's not a divisive issue. This one, however, clearly is... Uh, Gaius was a very common name of the time. It could have been as common as John itself within the first century and within that culture. But what's more important is, uh, is what characterized this man, Gaius, as we read the Scriptures. Now, you can find the name five times in the New Testament here, and you can find it in Acts 19 and Acts 20, where we read of Gaius of Derby, a traveling companion of Paul. In Romans 16 and 1 Corinthians 1, we read of Gaius in Corinth. Uh, could be the same Gaius, we don't know. He says, but we do know this, John says, whom I love in truth. That should sound familiar. We talked about that last week, about love and truth, complementary to one another. To, to love somebody apart from the truth is, is, is really not love, to be honest with you. You've got to love people enough to say the truth, but say it lovingly. At the same time, <laughs> to share the truth apart from love can be quite brutal at times. But John and all of us Christians should be able to love in truth. And, and, and John does that here with this man Gaius. Verse 2, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. He calls Gaius beloved, which is to say dearly loved. You know, as most of you know, right, the, the, the noun is agape, right, this godly love. The verb is agapeo the verb form of that love, but the one being loved is agapetos, the subject of love. And he says to uh, the guys, you're the subject of my love. You're dearly loved. But he says, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And I like this. For John prays that this man would prosper in all things. We're going to find that this man is a faithful man in terms of hospitality and, and, and <clears throat> showing hospitality to Christians. John wants him to prosper in his business endeavors in his life <clears throat> so that he'll continue to do that. He wants him to prosper in his own physical health so he can continue to do the things that God has called him to do. But he prays that it's in proportion to the prosperity of a soul. Why do I say this? Some of you know where I'm going. But I got saved in the church. It was all about prosperity and health. And, and, and while I don't have a problem with those things so much, I do if it's at the expense of the prosperity of the soul. There's a lot of people who want money. There's a lot of people who want physical. I get all that. But for heaven's sake, your soul is so much more important. Amen? And I would rather grow in my faith and mature in my faith and, and, and mature as a man of God and then let prosperity and health and those things come in hand as God wills and only in proportion to my spiritual health. Amen? I think that needs to be said sometimes because 
We, we, you know, especially in the 80s, the decade of the evangelical and, and some of the church movements that have been going really since the 50s, 60s in this prosperity thing. Listen, I think what's far more important is your soul. Let's concentrate on that. Let the other things come in hand, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things will be. All right, let's just leave it there. Let's keep it in balance, right? Verse 3, we begin to see then John commend Gaius. He says, For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. So here John states why he prays that Gaius has prosperity and health in proportion to his spiritual prosperity. John is writing probably from Ephesus. He's been told by other believers about the legitimacy of this man's faith, evidenced by the fact that Gaius walked in truth. Now, as we stated previously, to walk in truth is to conduct oneself according to his Christian faith. It's not that Gaius only believed the gospel, that he lived his life according to the gospel. And people saw the legitimacy of that in his daily conduct. See, our, our, our call, gang, is, is a consistent call. It's a call to be consistent, not just to live for Jesus on Sunday. But every day. In Ephesians chapter 4, you know the book of Ephesians, right? It's about the doctrine and then it's about the walk. And in the first three chapters, is really about your person in Christ, your position in Christ, and God's plan through Christ. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. We're to walk worthy. Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's in a corporate sense. This is how we're to live. Now, John never states who it was who told him about Gaius' walk, but of, of course, in, in a day where letters were carried by hand, John is writing letters, they're being sent out to various individuals, and those people come back, and they give report of what they saw, how things are going. Verse 4, John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. This is a great verse. John's greatest joy is to see people continuing to walk out their faith in daily life. Now, let's face it, it's a, it's a great joy to see somebody come to faith in Christ, right? It's, that's a great joy, for sure. But it's an even greater joy to see them respond to Christ every single day. Can I ask you, brothers and sisters, when was the last time that you responded to Christ? Every day. Every day when I wake up, I get out my journal. I, well, I say six out of seven. I miss Saturday sometimes. This morning I had to read two passages, you know, to catch up. <laughs> yes, it's, an, it's not just you. It's me too. But we should respond to the gospel every day. We should live in the shadow of the cross. And John says, I have no greater joy than to see my children walking. That's present tense, walking in the truth. So that's the kind of life that edifies others. <clears throat> it puts forth a daily witness. It edifies the church. It builds God's kingdom. Spurgeon said this. He said, a man's life is always more forcible than his speech. When, a man, when men take stock of him, they reckon his deeds as dollars and his words as pennies. If his life and doctrine disagree... The mass of onlookers accept his practice and reject his preaching. How true that is. So John commends him <clears throat> for his, his consistent walk as a Christian, and then also for his hospitality beginning now at verse 5. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Again, here in verse 5, he calls Gaius beloved. Second time. 
And he says, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. See, John's affirming him regarding how he treats brothers, or that's people in the faith. And he says strangers. Now, brethren clearly speaks of believers. We, we get that. Strangers, in the context we find, it speaks about believers that he hadn't met previously. And John says, they've borne witness of your love before the church. So these believers that Gaius had served, both familiar and unfamiliar, had spoken of his hospitality to John and to the church where John was located at. Now, why would these men make it a point to let the entire church know of Gaius' hospitality? Why would they do that? Because they were blessed by it. See, hospitality is an often overlooked way to bless people. And it's not a big thing in today's society. In ancient society, believers and unbelievers alike, hospitality was just something that you did. Now if somebody knocks on your door, you're like, what's wrong? You know, is it the police? Is it the Mormons? Who is it? You know, why should I answer that door? In fact, just let me sink below the couch a little bit so they can't see my head through the front window. <laughs> and, and if we just really quiet and don't let that dog bark or go to, you know, just maybe they'll just go away. <laughs> it's true. And, and I understand, listen, you can't just open your front door to anybody. There's a lot of crazies out there, probably more per capita than there was in the first century, I'm thinking. <clears throat> but we are to be hospitable, of believers especially. Now, let me say this, that hospitality is more than just opening up your front door, opening up your fridge, or opening up your wallet. It's about opening up your life to other people. There's such an enrichment that happens when you sit down with people, even people completely different to you, and you have lunch with them, and you hang out with them, you converse, you hear their story, how they grew up, how you grew up. Sometimes you find a kinship, sometimes you just find a brother or sister you can really appreciate. Today, we're still called to be hospitable. I think we have to be wise. I don't think we check our brain out at the door. As I said, if somebody comes to my front door and there's hypodermic needles come falling out of his shirt or something, you know, and he's got his face tatted up like jelly roll, I'd probably say, well, you just hang here for a minute. Let me get my handgun and I'll come right back, you know. <laughs> Paul, you know, you could call Paul the apostle of faith, right? Romans chapter 12, he talks about presenting your body a living sacrifice. In all that context, he says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually, uh, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. Peter, being the apostle of hope, he says, above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another. He adds two other words, without grumbling. <laughs> Can I say, if you open up the front door, the fridge, your wallet, whatever, but you do it resentfully, you're still not being hospitable. Let me tell you why. Because that's the Lord's front door, that's the Lord's fridge, and that's the Lord's wallet. <laughs> And of course, now, John being the apostle of love, he commends Gaius for doing these things. Now, understand also in the first century, they weren't just to blindly open up their doors to hospitality. Usually, when an itinerant preacher or evangelist came around, he had some kind of documentation. Usually, the church that sent him would say, hey, this is, guy's legit. You know, they didn't have Yelp or, you know, Amazon reviews or something like that. And so, you know, that bit of diligence was taken care of by the sending church. But um, the Didache, which was sort of a, a, a church-printed uh, publication of the, of the first century church, they actually had a liturgy, and there were things involved. That actually gave qualifications by which a man had to meet to show him hospitality. So they weren't just blindly letting people in. People were being vetted, all right? 
But John continues and he says, If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. So Gaius has received believers into his home who he's known previously. He's received believers into his home who he didn't know previously. But John tells him if he sends them forward in a manner worthy of God, he would do well also. What does that mean? It means that Gaius was not expected to house these people indefinitely. There should be no such thing as a Christian squatter or freeloader. Those terms should not exist. Christian squatter, Christian freeloader. That shouldn't exist. And God forbid that it would. But when their work was done, then John is encouraging Gaius to send them forward, but to do it in a manner worthy of God. Well, what's that? John is saying to him, Send them forward so that they have enough to get to their next destination. So he wasn't just letting him into his home. He was funding the next leg of their journey. If they needed supplies, Gaius is exhorted to give it to them. If they needed money, Gaius is exhorted to provide it to them. See, Gaius here was recognized as being faithful to bring people into his home, he's also encouraged to send them out faithfully also. Now, some of you might, might be thinking, what, let somebody into my home? That's pretty challenging today, isn't it? What, give them money so they can get to their next detonation on my dime? Don't you think that's a little excessive, Bill? Well, John gives us three answers or three reasons why we should do that, beginning at verse 7. He begins, because they went forth for his name's sake. So this is the first reason, because they went forth for his name's sake. That is, they traveled, they itinerated, they evangelized, they ministered, they taught for the purposes of God. So understand then, that we're not expected to take believers into our home because they're here for the state fair this year. Nor are we expected to finance some recreational trip to the Caribbean for them. We're expected to provide for their needs as they serve the Lord. <clears throat> Last year, a brother I know, a guy named Larry Stevens, he comes to Minot every year. He has a little RV, and he travels the country. You know what his ministry is? He sings hymns on his beautiful Martin guitar in the nursing homes. That's his ministry. I don't know, when was the last time you sang a hymn in a nursing home? Somebody's got to do it, right? Somebody's got to encourage. Larry does that. He travels between, like, Louisiana, Minot, North Dakota, and, like, probably uh, Southern Oregon. He has kind of a circuit, he does. He came here, and... And he's got two really bad tires on his RV. I'm like, what are you going to do about that? I don't know. <laughs> we're going to go to Walmart and we're going to get you some tires. And we, what's it? Because we should. You know? That, that's what we're called to do. Now, he's a legit guy. I know he's a legit guy. He's, he's, I met him through a mutual friend of mine in the ministry. And, and so uh, he, he vouches for him. We can take care of him. God forbid that we don't. I could have said, well, you know, I've got a big radio project. Oh, you know, we haven't bought the building yet. We're still renting it, you know. Or we could stop making excuses and we can make good. That's the first reason, because they went forth for his namesake. The second reason, taking nothing from the Gentiles. This is where we're going to get really close to home here. God places the responsibility of funding His work on His people. Not those who are not His. So often, Christians don't want to use the money that God's entrusted to them to fund His work. They would prefer the non-believers to do it. Right? That's the reason somebody says, Hey, Bill, we want to have a car wash. Hey, Bill, we want to have a bake sale. And I'm like, oh, okay. Why don't you have a prayer meeting first, okay? And then come back and talk to me. And it's not because I, I dislike clean cars and blueberry muffins. I happen to prefer both of those. What I don't like is the outsourcing of the financing for God's work. As I said to you before, the preacher got up before the congregation. He says, I have good news and bad news. 
The good news is we have all the money we need for the new building project. The bad news is God keeps it in your pockets. Just saying. Absolutely true. You know, God gives all of us paychecks, either weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, what, through our employers to provide for our needs. But out of that, we're also expected to provide for our brother's needs. And if we don't, then what does that say about our appreciation for what God has given to us? Can I just say that everything in your wallet and your bank account belongs to God? Is it so unreasonable that he says, listen, give me 10% and I'll give you 90? Now, God doesn't mandate the tithe in the New Testament. I understand that. I believe that all the, the blessings of Malachi are still in play. I found it to be true in my own life. But sometimes we, we dupe ourselves into thinking that it's our money, and it never was. It's all God's. And so, listen, gang, we're not only called to do God's work, we're also called to fund it God's way. Verse 8, this is the third reason. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. You see, when you fund a missionary, you become a fellow worker in his work. Now, not everybody here is called to be a missionary. I know, I started the service. I said, yeah, I have this dream that all of you will go out and start works. But I understand not everybody's called to be a missionary, but everybody can support a missionary. You say, well, Bill, I am flat broke. I got nothing. I'm on Social Security, whatever. I get it. Can you pray for them? Would you pray for them? You see, you, you show hospitality. You, you, you fund them to get them to the next stop. Then you are an equal partner. Go off script a little bit. First Samuel chapter 30. You guys know the story. David is going after the Amalekites. They've come through Ziklag. They've raised the city. They've taken all David and his men's... Uh, Goods, children, and wives. And David seeks the Lord because his guys want to stone him. You know, that's the lonely part of leadership. Sometimes not everybody appreciates the way things go and you're the bad guy. It comes with the territory. So gang, don't be surprised. But David, his guys want to stone him. He seeks the Lord. The Lord says, no, go after them. So he goes after them. But his, some of his guys can only go so far. They can't cross this particular brook. They're exhausted. <clears throat> so David says, hey, have those guys dismount. We'll leave all our goods with them, whatever we have. Let's travel light. Those guys can stay and watch our stuff. The rest of us will go and we'll go after the Amalekites. And they do. And they, they destroy the Amalekites. They get everything back, all their wives, all their children, all their goods. And then they come back over the brook and the guys, David's men are like, well, we're not going to share with these guys because you know what? They didn't go with us. And David says, don't ever let it be said because they, they did all that they could to get us there. We continued on. And they were then required to divvy up the spoil with those who had stayed behind. Because it's really not about how gifted you are. It's not what you bring to the table. It's what you leave on the altar. Was that not the case in, in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12 where Jesus sees the woman giving two mites? She gave her everything. And we sometimes think, oh, well, I tithe this much. I should have more say in the church than anybody else. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, find another church if that's going to... Amen? I, I got no time for that. <laughs> See how successful I am. <sighs> the stench in the nostrils of God. You might be successful. Great, praise the Lord. But who gave you that brain? Who gave you those abilities? Who gave you those gifts? Who blessed the work of your hands? It's all Him. Well, Gaius has been commended for his consistent walk in the faith and for his hospitality. And now we move to our second man. Diotrephes, his name is, and he's criticized. 
<clears throat> John says in verse 9, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. So John had written previously to this church that Gaius is part of, but one individual, Diotrephes by name, refused to allow John's letter to be read to the church at large. We don't know what that letter was. Some believe it was 2 John. Maybe that's why John gets very specific in names here in 3 John where he didn't in 2 John. But John states that this man loves to have preeminence. Now, loves to have preeminence is one word in Greek. It's philoprotuo. Philo means fondness. Protos means first. And so this means to have a love of being ahead of others or being above others. And this man had enough sway, maybe he was the pastor, whatever, I don't know. He had enough sway that he was able to stop John's letter from being read to the rest of the church. Can I make a few comments regarding, regarding church leadership, gang? Number one, church leadership is given for the purpose of serving God and His people. And if you're going to be a church leader, it better be because you love God and love His people, and not because of what you might get out of it. Because what you might get out of it is not always fun. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> Number two, church leadership is entrusted for the purposes of seeing God's will done, not to facilitate a leader's personal agendas, desires, or egos. Point number three, church leaders are only stewards. They are not owners. This is not my church. That is not my budget, and you are not my people. You are my people in a hip sense, okay? <laughs> like, yeah, that's my people. But uh, you are not my people in an ownership sense, okay? Point number four. Church leadership exists for the purpose of establishing and maintaining good order, not for the purpose of establishing and maintaining personal superiority. Point number five. In essence, church leaders are no better than anyone else. But as it relates to church leadership, we are not equal in our, in our authority. And my last point is this, that church leadership is a delegated authority. The authority doesn't come from the man. It comes from the Lord, who reserves the right to put men in and take them out whenever he wants. And so often, I, I don't know what it is, I think it's because the seminaries have largely failed to teach men how to study and teach the scriptures. And we taught them church management principles that have largely been developed by Madison Avenue and other places. We get these really weird ideas in churches about what leadership should look like. I'm gonna be honest with you, it even happens here sometimes because we grew up in sort of this, um, our, our, our checks and balances of our own governmental system. And, and I, I think there needs to be checks and balances on church leadership. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes, if you're going to be a leader, you just got to get moved forward in the things that God told you about, and sometimes you go alone. All right? Now, when we were starting to build the radio, this new radio project, we're getting everything put together, the board of directors said, Bill, why don't you slow your roll a little bit? You know, <laughs> you're throwing some big numbers out there, you know, and uh, wow, we're not quite comfortable in this. You know what I did? I slowed my roll. I have a board of directors. I answer to them, right? What we should do. But there are some times when you have to just go at it alone. But you better be right. <laughs> if not, you're going to hurt a lot of people along the way. Mark chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus is speaking about leadership. You know, the posse was having arguments over who's going to be greater in the kingdom. You know, this kind of thing. Jesus said in Mark 10, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. 
but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Ah, you want to be promoted in the church structure? Well, that means getting down and serving more people. It's not about people serving you. It's about you serving people. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that doesn't fade away. I like that because Peter says, hey, listen, do what God's called you to do. Do it for all the right reasons. And listen, look for your reward in heaven. Don't look for your reward here. And he says, by being an example, not being harsh with people, not manipulating people. It's easy to do, sadly. But I like it, it says, shepherd the flock which is among you. He doesn't say shepherd the flock that is below you. Because in the end, even the pastor and the church leaders are sheep. As I said before, I'm a sheep with a bell, but I'm a sheep. And, and then Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy. For by faith you stand. It's not my job to lord over people. Look, if you have completely different views on certain things, I understand, and you can bring it to me. We may not agree, and we'll butt heads, and eventually you will walk away like so many have and said, Bill, you're exhausting, because I'm not going to budge. Amen? Not if it's related to the proper exegetical understanding of God's Word. We can argue over the color of the carpet. I don't care. Not my gig. I don't even have to have my preference. In fact, I rarely get my preference around here but God gets his. And that's what I care about. Now, if you love to push your personal agenda on God's people rather than serve them and teach them his word, then you can be sure certain problems are going to emerge. And John lays out one of them here in verse 10, this idea of criticism. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. John begins verse, nine with, uh, verse 10 with, therefore. Diotrephes had this attitude regarding leadership that has caused John then to determine that if he can get to that church, he's going to call this man out publicly for his failure in leadership. And the first Failure he mentions here is prating against us with malicious words. Now, prating or pratting, however you want to um, pronounce that word, the idea is, is silly or trivial words. But they're put together and sent out, he says, with malicious intent. It could be made up. It could be small things that uh, are blown up outside of proportion, you see, and, and it's put out there with bad intentions. <clears throat> and it seems that word had gotten back to John about certain things that this church leader had to say. Now, why would somebody do such a thing? Why would somebody, listen, gang, uh, make trivial issues into giant issues and send that stuff out maliciously? Well, John's already told us that this man loves his position. He loves to be preeminent. And that's obviously because of the power, the authority that comes with it. And if you have a man like John, who's got a consistent testimony of 60 plus years, he walked with Jesus personally, he's the last one left, then that's a threat to this man's leadership. Godly leaders are always a threat to ungodly leaders. And so this man criticized John in an effort to minimize his influence over the people. But isn't that why we tend to criticize people? Because of our own insecurities? It's been rightly said, gossip hurts three people, right? 
It hurts the person you gossiped about. It hurts the person you gossip to. And it hurts you also. Because God will hold us accountable for every word we speak. That's a terrifying thing. That's a terrifying thought. Praise God that uh, Christ died for me. Amen? Because there's a backlog of trashy stuff that came out of this orifice a long time ago and sometimes even tries to slip out now. Thank you, my Lord Jesus, for your blood. Luke chapter 6, verses 44 and 45. Jesus gets to the heart of the problem. He says, every tree is known by its fruit. Men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's the heart of the issue. The heart of every issue is always the human heart. Proverbs 10, verse 18, whoever hides, whoever hides hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. Don't play the fool, gang. You will never make your candle brighter by blowing other people's candles out. Amen? Continuing on, John writes, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren. As John had sought to bring word to the church and its pastor, Diotrephes refused to receive those who were sent on John's behalf. This is the antithesis of hospitality, the hospitality that Gaius was commended for in our earlier verses. <clears throat> it wasn't the opening of a door, it was a refusal to answer the door. Uh-oh. <laughs> it was based on self-interest and not others' interest. And it refused godly people who were doing God's word, uh, doing God's work in favor of personal agendas and preferences. Let me just say this. It is always a danger when you're a leader and you don't want to listen to the criticisms of the people around you. I don't like the criticisms, but that doesn't mean they're not true. And it doesn't mean I don't need to hear them. And I, I've seen this too many times in the ministry where men didn't want to receive the criticisms of godly people around them. So if you're a church leader or you think God might be calling you to it, let me say this, stay humble and consider what your critics have to say. Just don't overanalyze it. Because that's where the, the danger comes. We tend to overanalyze things. And if that wasn't enough, John also writes, and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. So not only did Diotrephes not show hospitality to brothers who came on John's behalf, he also forbade anybody who dared to do so and threatened to kick them out of the church. Now you might think, well, that's not a big deal. I'll just go to another church. But the, that wasn't the, the context of the first century. The church was the church. That's it. There was no Baptist church, Methodist church, Presbyterian church, and they're all lined up on 21st Avenue or what? None of that. And so there was nowhere else to go. To be removed from the church was to be sort of socially ostracized and, and even occupationally as well. But for Dio Dreyfus, this was a fight for control and it was personal. And people were expendable towards his ends. That's the scary thing. That people were expendable. Verse 11, beloved. Remember, he's still speaking to Gaius. The third time he's called him beloved. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. See, this is all in context to the way Diotrephes had conducted himself in the church. John doesn't describe this man's behavior as unfortunate, as misguided, or even as a failure. He characterizes it as being evil. The word evil here is kakos. It speaks of that which is worthless, depraved, injurious, or, or wicked. wicked. 
So John is saying here to Gaius, dearly beloved brother, don't do as that guy does. Don't be that guy. I would repeat that, the same thing. There's a lot of leaders being raised up here. Don't be that guy. Don't do it. John continues, says, He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. John here is diagnosing Diotrephes' eternal condition. And the fact that he can act that way in the church over God's people is indicative of his spiritual condition. And John says, he hasn't seen God. He hasn't perceived God. He doesn't know who God is. You can't see God and mistreat people. You get a, a, a glimpse of God, a perception of God in your mind, you get a perception of who you are in light of that. And who you are in light of that then gives you a compassion for your brothers and sisters too. You can't mistreat people and claim you know God. And if you mistreat people, it's because you've lost sight of God in your desire for lesser things. Dio Trefe's lost sight of who he was and supposed to serve. Excuse me, uh, of who God is and, and serving him, and he became a self serving man instead. And his conduct is the inevitable result of that. So this morning, gang, let's determine to stay away from certain things. Fair enough? Selfish ambition, stupid talk that's intended to hurt people, a lack of hospitality, and controlling attitudes in the actions that they give birth to. Stay away from that stuff. So, John has commended Gaius, he's criticized Diotrephes, and now we meet our third man, verse 12, Demetrius. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself, and we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. He says, Demetrius has a good testimony. We don't know who Demetrius is. I suspect that he's the messenger who will carry this particular letter to Gaius. And so John is giving Demetrius his endorsement so that Gaius brings him into his home and shows him hospitality. <clears throat> and we read that this man had a good testimony from three witnesses. The first, from all. That is, all who were at the church of Ephesus or whatever place that John wrote this letter from. All people there recognized that this was a good man. It wasn't just that his mother thought he was a good man or his grandmother thought he was a good man, okay? It's that the brothers and sisters around him in the church recognized that he was a good man. Because, you know, sometimes your mother and your grandmother will tell you certain things that aren't true. And you'll see them because they'll, they'll become contestants. They'll try to be contestants on American Idol or something like that. And then Simon will say, what brought you here? Well, my mom told me I was a really good singer. Don't believe her, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, it breaks my heart to see that. I can't even watch that. I, I watch like a few minutes of those horrible auditions and I just have to walk away. I'm just, oh, you know. The truth and love would have helped a lot in that case. But the second witness is from the truth itself. So just as Gaius walked in the truth, so this man Demetrius did as well. He's commended for it. Their lives were characterized by a habitual obedience and alignment to God's word. So this man lived above reproach. There wasn't some big issue in his life that you could call him out on. And then John gives us the third witness, and we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. So John and those immediately around him, it could be church leadership. They were the third witness to say this man, Demetrius, is a, is, is a good guy. He's, he's the real deal. Listen, when the church, the word, and the elders all testify to your good reputation, you're probably walking in the truth. In the end, your walk, what you walk in, determines your testimony. If you're faithful to God, the people around you are going to recognize it. In the case of these three men, right, Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius, two out of three aren't bad. But one out of three was terrible. Verse 13, John gives his final greetings here. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. 
<clears throat> very similar to his, his final greeting in the last letter. John had a lot to say, but he would prefer to speak to Gaius face to face. No doubt there were other issues of a delicate nature that are best handled in that kind of discretion. Listen, not every dispute, not every issue has to be public. Discretion is very, very important. Things that social media doesn't offer, discretion. Verse 14, I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. So John is wise here. He, he hopes to see Gaia soon, but he also knows that he's not in control of the calendar. He says, I hope to see you shortly. It's his intention. It's his desire. But how many of you really control your day timer? I, I try. Yeah, I try like crazy, but yeah, no, doesn't work. You know, I... but John makes his plans. He commits them to God. So Proverbs 16, 1 says, right, the preparations of the heart belong to man. That is your responsibility. Do your planning. But the answer is from the tongue. That's from the Lord. Usually all your planning gets you moving so God can make the corrections. He says, peace to you. Very typical closing of a personal letter at this time in culture, right? Irene in, in Greek, shalom in, in, in the Jewish tongue. He says, our friends greet you. Not just John. All of us. He's letting Gaius know, hey, we're all behind you. And then he says this, greet the friends by name. I love this word greet because <clears throat> aspazomahi, it literally means without space. And it refers to enfolding the arms around someone, not allowing there to be space between you. And, and so it's used to refer then to a, a, a warm greeting. It's not a casual, hey, what's up? How you doing? You know, we say those kind of things. We don't even wait for an answer, right? Because you're not interested in the answer. Hey, what's up, bro? <laughs> John's like, nah, greet them. He's, in fact, he says, greet the friends by name. And that's John's heart, right? He's the elder. He's the last living apostle of Jesus Christ. He's a fixture throughout all the churches in the region. And he says, give them a big hug for me. John's, he was the elder, right? A big man for sure, but he wasn't too big for the individual. Greet them all by name, he says. I love it. So it's a story of three men. Two out of three weren't bad. One was terrible. Don't be that guy. Amen? All righty. Well, we're running five minutes late, but that's not too bad if you're going to do an entire book of the Bible in one sitting. Even if it's one of the shortest ones. <laughs> <clears throat> but let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, uh, because these are basic things, uh, but we have to be reminded of, of the fundamentals. Oh, my Lord, may we be a people of a consistent walk. But I thank you, Lord, that even consistent walking is a development of our spiritual faith. As it is, as toddlers develop, they learn to walk consistently. <laughs> And Lord, when we fall and split our lips open, Lord, pick us up, brush us off. Thank you that your grace doesn't allow us to stay there on the ground, but we get up and we keep moving forward. Oh, but Lord, as it relates to leadership and handling your people, oh, find us faithful, Lord, to, to get our cues from you, Lord, and not from the world. I, I pray that you will always be the pastor here and I'll be a an associate pastor or assistant pastor at best. Lord, but may we always be led by you, by your spirit and by your word, Lord. And, and I thank you, Lord, for those faithful men. We don't know who Demetrius is, Lord. And we may never know the names of so many faithful men and women in the church, but thank you for them just the same. Thank you for the example they set, Lord. And for the kingdom they build. In Jesus' name. Amen.